argue forever who is the best team of all time, but as Jason said earlier, this is the best season we've ever seen. Kevin Sheedy joins Dick Reynolds as the most successful club in over 100 years at this famous club, and they have won their 16th premiership. For the better part of 100 years, the Essendon Football Club was seen as a juggernaut of the AFL. A footy club with a rich history, with plenty of highs and plenty of lows, led by their four-star general Kevin Sheedy and his right-hand man James Hurd. They would strike fear into the hearts of footy clubs who were unfortunate enough to have them in their fixture for the following week. Tied with Carlton and Collingwood for the most amount of premierships won in AFL history, they seemed well on their way to securing a record-breaking 17th premiership, but seemingly overnight the Bombers would slowly dip in form. Before their reputation and identity were dragged through the mud, they would surpass 7,000 days without winning a final, and a group of young players and ill-fated coaches were left to pick up the pieces to try and restore Essendon to their former glory. How did this happen? Could it have been prevented? Will the Bombers ever return to the promised land? I'll certainly try to answer all of that and more as we take a trip down the road to 7,000 days. And they've beaten the chance. Hurd, Hurd, the fairy tale's complete. After a horrible week, James Hurd, you are a genius. Hurd and Broadbury to go to man. James Hurd, what a mark. You reckon that's probably just about doing it. Oh, the man, James Hurd, is down at one timing. One timing, supreme timing from a supreme player. To all the Essendon fans, supporters out there, I'm very proud to announce that I'll be the coach of the Essendon Football Club for the next uh, four years. With the AFL Commission set to hand down sanctions within the hour, the game's governing body is finally poised to cleanse football's reputation following arguably its darkest hour. This is a devastating decision for the past and present players of the Essendon Football Club. It's our view that they've been horribly let down by the administration of the time. Inside, missed the target. Over the back it comes. Petrie around the corner. Snap goal. He's got it. They're back in front by five north. This is one of the most exciting days in the football history. Congratulations. Welcome to our football club. Appreciate it. And um, good luck. Thank you. It is a massive win. 126 points. It's the biggest sound ever. They've killed off the Bombers. Stringer on the left. Darwin gets in the front spot. Top of the square. He puts it through the middle. And the Bombers find some dream time magic. He's kicked the winner on three times. It's the Bombers who prevail. Now, in the 1800s, the early days of the Essendon Football Club, their history was defined by uncertainty and instability. Our great game was still in its infancy. There were no established rules or governing bodies. Additionally, the Essendon Football Club, as with every single football club in the league at the time, were marred with a lack of funding and a lack of football facilities. There was consistently a shortage of players and there was just a lot of instability within the footy club. Imagine back when you were playing under 14's footy and you had to travel for an away game. And this week you were going to a really festy footy oval in the bad part of town. Uh, which had homeless people camping in the scoreboard and whose club president had probably spent time in prison and they were also in charge of like five other game day jobs due to a lack of volunteers and the away change room straight up violated the Geneva Convention. They were communal rather than cubicle and you had to make that sexuality defining choice between subjecting your family to a terrible smelling car ride home or showering together in the communal showers that looked like they were built back before women were even allowed to vote. That was every single massive footy club in the game today during the 1800s. Despite these challenges, the Essendon Football Club continued to grow and develop and by the turn of the 1890s, they would emerge as one of the premier football clubs in Melbourne. One of the defining moments of their history came in 1873 when the club played their first ever recorded game against Carlton, playing against their reserves and winning by a single goal. This kicked off one of the most fierce 
and storied rivalries within our great game, which probably deserves its own video, truth be told. In 1877, the club joined the Victorian Football Association as one of its foundation members. This power play would be crucial in developing Essendon into a major football club and giving them more opportunity for financial and social growth. They had a cracking run in the VFA, winning four premierships in a row between 1891 and 1894. Must be nice. Uh, back on subject. The next pivotal moment in Essendon history came in 1896 when they left the VFA to join the newly formed Victorian Football League as well as several other foundation clubs. The new league brought with it a new final structure instead of just giving the first place team on the ladder the flag every year as well as the current scoring structure. Uh, despite early dominance from Fitzroy, Collingwood and Carlton, Essendon were able to win their inaugural premiership in 1897. They would bag another premiership in 1901, and they would end up winning back-to-back -back flags in 1911 and 1912. On-field success did dry up for a little bit. They didn't win their next flags until 1923 and 1924, bringing their total tally up to six, but they were still establishing themselves as a mainstay in VFL football. Uh, the 1930s didn't have the same success, most of the clubs were struggling with the Great Depression at the time, but the league itself was able to rebound in the 1940s, and in the most significant moment for the club's identity, they would begin to call themselves the Bombers, in reference to the Air Force base stationed at Essendon Airport during World War II. Uh, speaking of World War II, they did end up losing a few players to military service, but remarkably, they were able to win the 1942 Premiership despite the list deficiencies that they were struggling with at the time. They won three more flags in 1946, 1949 and 1950, and in 1949, we were blessed with one of the greatest players in AFL history, John Coleman, who kicked 537 goals in 98 games. To put this in perspective for young fans of the game, Buddy Franklin kicked 305 goals in 102 games. It took Buddy 320 games to kick a thousand goals. Imagine what John Coleman could have done with 320 games. The Bombers had a chance to go for three in a row in the 1952 Grand Final. However, much like another powerhouse team in the 21st century, they would end up getting stitched up by the AFL. You see, John Coleman struck a Carlton defender after Coleman himself was struck twice and despite not even instigating the encounter, he was suspended for the entire final series and Geelong would put away a compromised Bombers team to deny the Bombers their free peat. After Coleman's career was cut short due to an injury, the Bombers would not win any more premierships for the rest of the decade. They did come close in 1957 and 1959, but to no avail. In 1961, however, we saw the return of the King. John Coleman would return to the footy club, this time as a coach. Incredibly, he took the club to a premiership in 1962 in just his second year as a coach. He got another flag in 1965 before he was forced to stand down due to health reasons. Sadly, in 1973, John Coleman would pass away from a heart attack at just 44 years of age. After John Coleman passed away, the footy club ended up experiencing some major instability in the coaching department. Five different coaches were tried from 1968 until 1980, and none of them would last for more than four years. After getting beaten badly by St Kilda in their 1973 elimination final, the club would not make finals again for the rest of the 1970s. The club was in a bad slump, and it would take an extraordinary man to pull them out of the hole they found themselves in. Kevin Sheedy would join the Essendon Bombers in 1981, and the Bombers would never be the same. He united the club, and his influence on the playing group was evident almost immediately. Essendon reached the grand final in 1983, the first time since 1968. Unfortunately, the good news ends there. Hawthorne won by 83 points, which was, at the time, a record losing margin for a grand final. They did come back with a vengeance in 1984, however. They would win the ultra prestigious pre season competition and finish the regular season on the top of the ladder. The Bombers completed their revenge tour by beating Hawthorne in the 1984 grand final to win their 13th Premiership, which was their first since 1965. The teams met again in the 1985 grand final, which Essendon also won. At the start of 1986, Essendon were considered the favourites to win three successive flags. Unfortunately, the footy gods had other ideas. 
several injuries to various key players would result in the club winning only 8 of its last 18 games in 1986 and only 9 games and 1 draw in 1987. In 1988, Essendon would bounce back as they finished in 6th place with 12 wins which included a 140 point destruction of the poor Brisbane Bears. You should go watch my Brisbane Bears video by the way, I'll, I'll leave a link in the bio. In 1990, Essendon would be the benchmark team throughout almost the entire home and away season. However, they came undone in that year's grand final at the hands of Collingwood. Following the retirement of their aging key players in the early 1990s, the team was restructured and built around new players such as Gavin Wanganeen, Joe Mercedi, Mark McCurry, Michael Long, Dustin Fletcher and James Hurd, one of the greatest players of our time. He was unbelievably taken at number 79 in the 1990 draft. This young but talented side would become known as the Baby Bombers. They would win the 1993 grand final against Carlton and that same year, Gavin Wanganeen won the Brownlow medal, the first bomber to win the award since 1976. Three years later, James Hurd was jointly awarded the Brownlow with Michael Voss of the Brisbane Bears. That same year, the Bombers would fall agonizingly short to the Brisbane Bears in the first week of finals, as well as the Sydney Swans in one of the greatest preliminary finals we have ever seen. In 1999, the Bombers would play off in yet another classic preliminary final, where they would go down by a single point after a Fraser Brown game-saving tackle on Dean Wallace. Kevin Sheedy would famously make them attend the 1999 grand final as a way to motivate them for the next year. Joe Mercedi described this as the worst experience of his life. This experience would have to have been even more depressing when you consider that Carlton got belted on the day while the Bombers would have gone in as clear favourites. The heartbreak of the prelim final, combined with Sheedy's motivational tactics, combined with the criminally talented playing list, would create the perfect storm for the greatest single year of football that we have ever seen. So Essendon are charging onto a grand final. A grand final they couldn't make last season. And the heartache is a thing of the past. Bombers are through. It'll be the Bombers and the Demons. On their end of season footy trip to Barcelona in 1999, all they could think about was getting back the next year to get revenge. In an ESPN article several years later, several of the players are quoted as saying, we went on that footy trip knowing still in the back of our minds that we lost. We could have beat them and we could have been out here celebrating a premiership. I remember Merckx and Joe Mercedi by the pool and they were saying, we've missed an opportunity and we've got to get it back. It wasn't like a throwaway thing. They genuinely wanted to get back the next year, giving feedback for the younger guys. What's ridiculous about this footy trip they literally began pre-season while they were in Barcelona. In Barcelona, a few weeks after the game, four or five of us are in the gym training, which normally doesn't happen. It probably showed the mindset of where the players were at. Another thing that worked in the favour of the Bombers was that the season would be starting earlier by about one month due to the Sydney Olympics taking place later in the year. This worked perfectly for the Bombers. Whilst other teams may have been lamenting the lost time off, the Bombers were ready to start the revenge tour almost immediately and they took no prisoners. They would further justify their feelings of 1999 being a missed opportunity when they demolished North Melbourne in the preseason grand final. Now the preseason premiership wouldn't mean much for most teams. Some even see it as a curse, but the Bombers would go on to have one of, if not the single greatest season in AFL history. They demolished team after team after team. Their winning streak would go on to be 20 and 0 before the literally game changing super flood stopped the Bombers in their tracks. But they didn't let this one loss deter them. They would not lose another game for the entire season, obliterating North in the qualifying final and completing their revenge tour by beating Carlton by 40 points in the preliminary final before they would beat Melbourne handily in the grand final next week. And so, one of the greatest seasons in AFL history was complete. They won everything that year, except for the Brownlow and obviously the Wooden Spoon. They won the preseason, the regular season, the Coleman and the Norm Smith. On top of splattering them the previous week, the Bombers would tie the record for most premierships won with Carlton, thus taking away their bitter rival's biggest bragging rights. It was perfect. Nobody could stop them. Nothing was going to go wrong. Well, that makes me pretty mad. Oh yeah? Yeah. I might have to beat someone up just to get rid of all this blind fury. Wow. Yeah, I feel pretty sorry for the next guy who looks at me funny. Mm, what 
What about that guy? <laughs> the AFL world, and in particular the Essendon Bombers, would be forgiven for assuming business as usual. These mighty Bombers had trounced all other competition. Everyone was already assuming that they would get back-to-back -back flags. Some were even considering a free peat, which hadn't been done for almost 50 years at that time. If the Bombers were going to be stopped, it would take an extraordinary team to bring them down. And now we arrive at the first top on the road to 7,000. Round 10, 2001. The Essendon Bombers, still as dominant as ever, came into that game 8-1, sitting pretty at the top of the ladder. Their opponents for that game would be the Brisbane Lions, a seemingly hapless team. Despite finals appearances in 1999 and 2000, the Lions were struggling to find form. Only two weeks earlier, they were embarrassed by future Suvlaki Hut spokesperson Anthony Kudafides and the Carlton Footy Club. They looked to be no hope. However, behind the scenes, something special was brewing. Lee Matthews knew he had a talented list. Instead, the key to beating Essendon would be a mental game. At the final siren of round 10, the AFL world discovered that the Bombers bled and the Lions were looking to kill. But hang on, the Bombers are still a bloody good football team. There was no cause for concern. They would go on to make another grand final like everyone thought they would, and they were going to overcome this new Brisbane team, and they would go on to win their inevitable back-to-back -back premiership. A bit of history here. Lee Matthews has been to the top of the mountain for a second time as coach, once at Collingwood, and now he's done the impossible. Brisbane have won the premiership. But they didn't. On this day, a dynasty would be born and another would die. The Bombers were upset by Lethal's Lions and the Bombers were shell-shocked. As of recording, they have never even come close to getting to another grand final. And as the salary cap issues began to become more and more apparent, uh, they came to the realization that they may not be able to keep this list together much longer. Now following the heartbreak of 2001, they did stay competitive. In 2002, they would make it to the semi-final before falling to Port Adelaide, before their tight salary cap forced out key players Blake Carasella, Chris Hefferman, Justin Blumfield, Gary Moorcroft, and Damian Hardwick via trades to different clubs. History would repeat itself the next year, and now we find ourselves at one of the most infamous dates in the history of the Essendon Football Club. September 4th, 2004 a day that would live in infamy. On this day, the Essendon Bombers would scrape past the Melbourne Demons in the elimination final, and this fairly innocuous game would turn into a focal point of pain, frustration, and heartbreak for Bombers fans, as this would be Essendon's last finals win for the remainder of the 2000s and the 2010s. They've come close to breaking this horrific hoodoo on numerous occasions, but to no avail. As of recording, the Current finals drought stands at 7,018 days. Damn. <laughs> so, a big win to Melbourne. An enjoyable night in one way, but also a night obviously tinged with sadness. As they said their final goodbyes to Troy Broadbridge. But they've done him proud tonight with a big 46 point win. In 2005, we would begin what I'll refer to as the Dark Ages. Essendon would miss finals for the first time since 1997, and things would only get worse in 2006. They would have their worst year under Kevin Sheedy in almost 20 years. The club improved its on-field position in 2007, but again missed the finals. This slight improvement wasn't enough to save Kevin Sheedy's job, as his contract was not renewed after 2007 thus ending his mammoth 27-year tenure as the Essendon Bombers coach. In a footy landscape where coaches are changed like undies, lasting 27 years as a coach at one club is incredible. Matthew Knights replaced Kevin Sheedy as coach, and he would last a measly three seasons compared to Sheedy's monumental 27-year tenure. During Knight's tenure, the Bombers wouldn't break their finals drought. They had their famous Anzac Day win against Collingwood in 2009, and also that game against Hawthorne where Matthew Lloyd absolutely obliterated Brad Sewell for literally no reason. On August 29th, 2010, shortly after the end of the 2010 season, Matthew Knight would be sacked as Essendon Bombers coach. However, on the 28th of September 2010, 
James Hurd would be appointed coach for 2011. The prodigal son has returned. Plus, former Geelong dual premiership winning coach and Essendon triple premiership winning player Mark Thompson would join Hurd on the coaching panel. In this super team's first season, Essendon finished 8th. However, a finals win would continue to elude them. At this point, it had been almost 7 years since Essendon had won a final. For a supporter base that had been so accustomed to success for so long, this had to have been pretty brutal. The club started really strongly in 2012, sitting 4th with a 10-3 record at the halfway mark of the season. But the club would only win one more match for the season, finishing 11th to miss the finals. Their massive drop in form, as well as injuries to several key players, would begin to make a lot more sense the next year. Okay, Mr. Griffin, now you've got your flu shot. Will you stop giving him flu shots, man? We got a show to do. Oh, Quagmire, it's cool, it's cool. This is the doctor that killed Michael Jackson. There are much better videos on this subject by more intelligent people than me, but I have to touch on this topic, even though it's been done to death already. During the 2013 season, the AFL and the Australian Sports Anti-Doping Authority, ASADA, commenced an investigation into the club in relation to its 2012 player supplements and sports science program. In particular, there were allegations regarding the illegal use of peptide supplements. Internally, there were concerns raised during the 2012 season regarding the program, and Stephen Dank was ordered to cease the program right around the time Essendon began their massive slump in form and began suffering from mass soft tissue injuries. Coincidence? Maybe. Maybe not. I'm not a scientist. On the 27th of August 2013, the club was found guilty of bringing the game into disrepute, and so the club was fined $2 million, stripped of early draft picks in the following two drafts, and sensationally were barred from the 2013 final series, despite finishing 7th on the ladder. Hurd was suspended from coaching for 12 months, several front office employees also resigned, including Chairman David Evans and CEO Ian Robson. For the 2014 season, assistant coach Mark Thompson would take over as head coach. In typical Bomber Thompson fashion, he led the club back to finals for a 7th place finish, but in a tense second elimination final against arch rivals North Melbourne, the Bombers would lead by as much as 27 points at half time before a resurgent Kangaroos comeback where they would end up winning the game by 12 points. After the 2014 season, Mark Thompson would leave to make way for Hurd's return into the coaching role. The Bombers' recovery plans were thrown into shambles in June 2014. 34 players were issued show cause notices alleging the use of banned substances during their now infamous program. The players were up against the AFL Anti-Doping Tribunal over the 2014 offseason, and remarkably, on the 31st of March 2015, the tribunal returned a not guilty verdict determining that it was not comfortably satisfied that the players had been administered the peptide. For Bombers fans, it seemed like the worst was over. James Hurd would return as senior coach for the 2015 season, and the team actually started strong in 2015. However, the club's form severely declined after the announcement that WADA, the World Anti-Doping Authority, would be appealing this verdict. This turn of events would absolutely devastate team morale. Imagine if you're in school and you do something really fucked up and your mum has to pick you up and you initially say to yourself, oh thank god it's just mum, I'll be okay and then she hits you with the, I'm gonna let your father deal with this when he gets home and then you realise you're fucked. Imagine that sinking feeling in your gut but multiplied by about 112. On the 12th of January 2016, the Court of Arbitration for Sport would end up overruling the AFL Anti-Doping Tribunal's decision arguing that these 34 players were guilty. As a result, all 34 players in question were given two years suspensions. Luckily, time was taken off these suspensions on account of the time served in 2014 and 2015. As a result of this, the Bombers would venture into the 2016 season with half their list gone. Despite the gloomy situation, the absence of its most experienced players allowed for the development of young players such as Zach Merritt, Darcy Parrish, and Anthony McDonald-Tippin-Woody 
To the surprise of nobody, the club would end up finishing last on the ladder, meaning that they would get their first wooden spoon since 1933. seem to be any damage at all. It just goes to show you that everything will work out if you have faith. It's all gone. Everything. Gone deadly on. 2017 was an incredible turnaround for the Bombers. Despite losing their beloved Captain Job Watson to retirement, they would rocket up to 7th on the ladder. However, they would fall short to the previous year's spiritual premiers in Sydney and their 13 years final drought would continue. They would get back in the finals, however they would make the fatal mistake of assaulting the nicest player on the ground and the Eagles would go beast mode and obliterate the Bombers by 55 points. They crashed and burned in 2020, finishing 13th, although to be fair, it was a COVID year so you could make the argument that it was a mulligan year. I personally do. Uh, the Bombers did make some history this season, unwanted or otherwise, when future Brisbane Lions legend Connor McKenna would become the first AFL player to test positive for COVID. McKenna would end up leaving the club at the end of the year, including several other key players, including 2024 Brisbane Lions Premiership player Joe Danaher, Adam Saad, Arazio Fantasia. Now in 2021, the club would improve its results considerably. Getting back into finals, only to fall to one of the worst four goal performances that I've ever seen in my entire life. 2022, in their 150th year celebration, things were really looking up. People were considering Essendon as a chance for top four. Some were even considering them premiership favorites. <laughs> the Bombers went into 2022 full of optimism and then It was bad. It was really, really bad. Is Matty Lloyd crying because he really likes Dyson Heppel's speech? Or is it because he's overcome with the realization that the footy club that he bled for, that he went to war for, was now a shell of its former self? The Bombers would end up finishing 15th. But, you know, luckily, it did seem to work out for the Bombers. They landed Brad Scott, who took North Melbourne of all clubs to two prelim finals. So, you know, he does have a history of turning chicken shit into chicken salad. Now, during the offseason, there was also this weird incident where uh, the Bombers CEO would step down and they replaced him with uh, a former bank CEO, Andrew Forburn. He did come under fire for being involved in a church called City on a Hill, an Anglican church in Melbourne. Now, for those unaware, you might be thinking to yourself, well, what's wrong with that? Um, <laughs> this particular church had previously preached against homosexuality and at one point had compared abortion to murder and also the holocaust yeah i'm not i'm not touching any of that shit with a 10 foot pole but the bro the bro literally had to resign after one day due to public and media pressure jesus man i'm starting to think that this footy club is genuinely cursed you know like fucking hell they did manage to move on from this disaster pretty quickly uh in 2023 the club was looking really promising. They were even pushing for top four at one point. Unfortunately, they kind of fell apart towards the end of the year. They suffered some key injuries and they would miss out on finals following back-to-back -back thumpings from GWS and Collingwood. And so here we are, about to enter 2024 and it looks to be a promising year for the Bombers. They made some good trades. They used their draft picks well. If the Bombers can stay consistent and healthy, I see them finishing in the eight. Um, winning a final is another story, but but you know it, it genuinely looks like the dark days of the supplement saga are behind the Bombers. We haven't seen any stupid controversies this offseason, and you know I think that's what the Bombers have lacked since the events of 2012 and 2013. Stability. We've seen long-time basket cases come from out of nowhere to come dangerously close to a grand final berth. Who knows, maybe next year it'll be the Bombers at the Gabba in a prelim final up 30 to nothing and I'll be drinking away my depression in a stairway at the Gabba for two years in a row. I certainly hope that doesn't happen again because I don't think I can handle it for a second year in a row but you know anything's possible. So I hope you've enjoyed this video, 
hopefully you don't have to wait as long this time around. And remember, tier 3 and tier 2 channel members got this video 3 days early, so keep that in mind. So, you know, like, subscribe, and, you know, ciao. Big shout out to our tier 3 channel members, Sharks Ray, Big Mac John, I hate the lions and think Flagmantle24 is real. Kanga, 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 Roo, 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 Kanga, Roo, Old Mate 1, PA Foopy, Gussie Mixtevo underscore 61, It's Not Too Late Egg to join the Orange Tsunami, and last but certainly not least, Sean Ducks. Please consider becoming a channel member, tier 1, tier 2, or tier 3. Any support is greatly appreciated.